So here we have a GCSE exam question. Fairly straightforward. We have to draw a histogram and think about bias. But part C gets quite tricky because they move into the area of probability and interpreting the histogram. And that requires a little bit more thinking. OK, let's have a look at the examiner's remarks. So the examiners say that part A was well answered with a variety of suitable reasons given for why the data collection method might not be suitable, might be biased. Uh, there were many correct histograms seen in part B, so that was done fairly well, with a smaller proportion than usual, though, failing to use frequency density. So that was a sort of positive comment, I guess. But part C apparently proved to be too challenging a question for people to answer it very well. So not many people got past part C correct. OK, so now this would be um, a good video for you to pause, give it a go yourself, and then look at the work solution and see if you were right. Let's start with the idea of bias. Um, well, what's the scenario? The police want to know how many cars exceed the speed limit. An officer stands with a speed gun and records the speeds of a thousand consecutive cars. So the scenario is to do with a thousand cars that are recorded with a speed gun. So how would bias creep into this exercise of recording the speed of a thousand cars? Well, we might think about um, bias in terms of probability. If you take uh, uh, record the speed of a car at once and then record it and think, well, it's was going quite fast. When you take the second observation, that bias might affect whether you decide whether it was over or above the speed limit. So it could be to do with this consecutive idea uh, that you get in probability, which means it's non-independent probability. That could be one kind of explanation. But I think the simpler one would be to say, well, does the police officer stand in the same place. We don't know. They, the officer could move. So that's to do with distance. Another source of possible bias could be that the officer doesn't record the speed of a thousand cars on the same day. A thousand is quite a lot. So it could be to do with different times. And on different times of the day, the light levels might be different, for example. So that could introduce bias into the experiment. And uh, a third idea might be to do with speeds of cars in different places being different, so to do with hills and location. So we'll say a third possibility that could introduce bias into the experiment is that the place might change where the, the officer chooses to take those readings. OK, so any one of those uh, explanations would get you the mark for part A. But let's have a look now at part B. OK, so in part B, we have to make uh, a histogram based on this grouped frequency table. First of all, let's have a look at the groupings. So uh, histograms tend to either have equal class intervals or unequal class intervals. A quick look at this shows me that these are unequal class intervals. So between 18 and 20, so on our uh, horizontal scale here, that would be between here and here, that's an interval of two, if I make a little note of that here. Whereas the next class interval between 20 and 25 is much wider. So that's an interval of five. So 25 minus 20, that's an interval, a width rather, of five. And then it goes up to 30 which again gives us another five as the width of our class interval. And then finally, we've got a width of 10, 30 to 40, right up to here, gives us an interval of 10. So what we know that we need to do now is label the vertical axis, not with frequency, but with frequency density. So let's do that now. Frequency density will be the scale on our uh, vertical axis, our y-axis. So that means we have to calculate area. A little trickier then than a histogram with equal class 
intervals. So if we've got to calculate area, it means we have got to calculate the height. We know the width, we don't know the height, which is the frequency density. So at the moment I can't draw the scalar here. I don't know how large to make these numbers. So first of all, I need to find the frequency density. In other words, I need to find the number times this width, the height times this width, that will give me this frequency. Okay, so if I don't know something, I use algebra. So I'm going to say 2, which is the width, so the width of the class interval times the height that I don't know, First, height of the first bar, so let's call it h1. That's got to come out as 80, so 2 times h equals 80. Here I've got 5 as the width, so 5 times the width of the second bar in the second class interval is going to come out at 440. Here I've got the third height, 5 times the third height, give me 360. And now 10 times the height of the fourth bar will give me a frequency of 120. So what, it, what are these heights, which is the frequency density? Okay. Well, if I divide both sides of this equation by 2, that will remove the 2 from the left-hand side, give me h1 to be 80 divided by 2. So let's write that down. And 80 divided by 2 is 40. So that's the first one there. Um, now, divide both sides by 5. So I'll have 440 divided by 5. So that's the same as... 880 divided by 10, in other words, 88. Now I've got 360 divided by 5, which is the same as 720 divided by 10, so 72. And finally, nice easy one, 120 divided by 10 this time. So that's only going to have a height of 12. So good. Now we've got the height of our four bars on our histogram. We can go ahead and draw the histogram. But before we do that, we need to decide on the frequency density scale. Well, it goes up to 88. We need to record 88. So I've got 100 squares. I think the easiest thing is if I just label it so 1 squared equals 1. So this must be 50. And I think that will do. Um, in terms of scale, I could number it up completely, maybe go up in tens, but I can see it pretty clearly. So in the interest of saving time, that's going to be perfectly sufficient. OK, so now let's have a go at drawing the height. Now, I've got to draw the height of the first bar up to 40. So if I make a little mark at where it's going to end up, 40 is going to be there. And the width we know is 2, so between 18 and 20. So that's my interval. So I now need to draw up to here and along to here. OK. Now I'm not going to draw down because I can see that my next bar is going to be higher. So I might as well start from here. Where is it going to go to? It goes up to a height of 88. So if I start by making a dot up here, so that's 90, so that must be 88. And it goes along to 25, which is between 24 and 26, so that's going to be here. Okay. And let's draw down, because I know that the next bar is going to be lower. Okay. So, up to 72, 
so it's going to be a long so if that was 90 that's 80 that's 70 and one of these is two so it's going to be from here and we know the width of the class interval so it's from here to here and finally we go up 12 and along to 40. Okay, and that completes the histogram. Let's then move on to part C. So in part C, it says the speed limit for the road is 30 miles per hour. And it's a good idea then if I look at the where that is on the histogram, so that's going to be here. Two cars, it says, are chosen at random from the thousand cars, so it's as if they're picked from a hat. And we've got to estimate the probability that both cars are, okay, at least 10% above the speed limit. So 10% above the speed limit is not going to be 30, it's going to be 110%, if you like, um, times 30. So let's just do that little calculation. So we've got 110% which is 110 over 100 times 30 or 1.1 times 30 and 0.1 of 30 is obviously 3 or 10% of 30 is 3 so it's going to be 30 plus 3 which is 33 miles per hour okay so now we've got the speed limit so we can draw that now onto our histogram at 33 so 33 is here and let's draw down then in the middle of this category like that okay so question I've got now is how many cars are there that are traveling above the speed limit because if I want to work out the probability I need to know that number divided by the number of cars, which is 1,000. Well, let's review what we know already. We know that there are 80 in this class interval. We know that there are 440 here. We know that there are 360 here. And we know that here we've got 120. So let's just write that outside for the moment. We've got 120 in this class interval, but we're dividing this now in half. So the width here is the first thing that I want to calculate. The width here is 3. From 30 to 3, at 33 is 3. So this width is going to be 3. And that must mean this width is 7. Let's just check. Two, four, six, seven. So what we had before was a width of 10. We've now got a width of 3 and 7. And that means we can now calculate the number of cars that are going above the speed limit. OK, so we've got in here, we've got 3 times uh, 12, which is 36. And in here, well, we could do it a number of different ways, but 7 times 12 um, is going to be double this, 72 plus another 12, 84. And let's just check to finish that that equals 120. So 30 plus 80 is 110. 6 plus 4 is 10. So 10 plus 110 is 120. So that must be correct. OK, so now we've got our figures. It's simply a case of working out the probability. And as long as you remember your probability theory, you should be able to answer the question. So let's think about this. We've got to pull two cars out of the hat. The first car is very straightforward. 84 out of 1,000. So the probability is 84 out of 1,000. 
But the second car is not, we're not going to have independent probability. It's non-independent probability because we've only got 99 not 99, 999, we've got one less car in our hat. We've also got one less that we're going to draw for, so it's going to be 83 cars now out of 99 is going to be the probability for the second car. And because it's quite unlikely, it's, it's, we're going to, the unlikelihood, if you like, is going to increase, we're going to multiply the first probability by the second probability to get a slightly smaller fraction, a smaller fraction anyway, um, when we multiply these two together, because it's quite unlikely that both cars are going to be 10% above the speed limit. Well, let's see what the probability is. So we, now we've got our calculation, we simply need to multiply across. So denominator first, nice and easy, we've got 1000 times 999. Well, that's going to be 9. 9, 9, with three zeros. Okay. Now, 84 times 83. Let's go to one side to do that calculation. And we've got a number of different ways of multiplying two digit numbers like this. I'm going to use the crisscross method, but if you want to use the standard algorithm or use calculator, that's fine. So we've got 3 times 4 is 12, so I'm going to put the 2 down, carry 1. We've got 24, make a little note here because I sometimes make a mistake, that's 24 plus 4 times 8, or 2 times 8 is 16, so that's 32. So we've got 24 plus 32, that's 56, plus that one, 57 then. Okay. And now we're going to go up and down. So we've done the crisscross, we're going to go up and down. So 8 times 8, 64, plus our 5, 69. So it's 6, 9, 7, 2. And if you've got a calculator, of course, check that that's correct on the calculator. All right. So... Now we can write that figure in. 84 times 83 is 6972. And there's our answer. The probability that both cars are at least 10% above the speed limit must be 6972 divided by 999000 or uh, 999,000. That's such a large figure, I do have a calculator with me, so I'm going to just check that that doesn't simplify. And although I could do that by halving and so forth, these are such large figures, it's going to be more likely that you will have a calculator, so let's just see how that comes out. Okay, so it does simplify, and it simplifies to 581 out of 83250, 83250. And finally, I'm going to press my SD button and find out what the decimal probability is. So it's 0 0.006, and then it's got a recurring decimal, so 978 recurs. So it's approximately. Well, that would round up to zero point, so it's less than 1%, 0 0.7%. So pretty unlikely that both cars are going to be at least 10% above the speed limit.